we can still see your beautiful face, but not the other information. That's how the um, the video is going to start, Lori, and I appreciate that. <laughs> okay, so um, let me turn off my little beautiful face for a minute, though. Um, so today we're going to be talking about supporting underprepared students and what that would look like in um, in your courses. We're coming from a variety of backgrounds here, so depending on the content, depending on the skills that we're expecting our students to demonstrate, your support might look different and that's okay. But there are also support systems on campus that can help you and the students. So once again, I am Lindsay, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm an inclusive teaching coordinator from um, CIDL. If you have questions or concerns after this presentation, please do reach out to me and I'm happy to talk one on one or, um, you know, chat on teams or respond to emails. So in today's workshop, we're going to identify strategies to assess students knowledge base and their readiness. Um, so that we can tailor approaches to their needs. We're going to explore methods for providing equitable assessments, materials, and opportunities. We're going to discuss practical techniques to enhance overall learning experience for our students. And we're going to learn how to create an inclusive learning environment. Um, so everybody um, benefits, including students that are underprepared. Um, and I just want to acknowledge that sometimes um, there are students that just seem wholly behind on everything, but there might be particular students that are suffering in just very specific areas, right? They don't have that, I don't know, biochemistry background that they needed for this specific science course, but they're uh, doing amazing in all these other areas or just doing well enough in all these other areas. So um, the type of support that you're providing for underprepared students, if you're providing it for everybody, everybody um, has an opportunity to benefit from that. Um, so there are, there's a bunch of research out there about students being underprepared now. And we're seeing this widening gap between um, expectations for college level skills and the skills necessary in order to graduate high school. And I wanna acknowledge that those uh, skills, there's been a gap for a while, especially depending on where you are coming from um, it might be at the state level, it might be um, region, it might be nation. So there have been gaps for a while. This exists. Um, but we're seeing that we have a more diverse student population than ever, um, which also means more diverse educational experiences. We're seeing students that are first generation college students. Um, I'm first generation. And it was difficult to navigate the, the college system. Um, we're seeing people that are low income, that are English language learners, that are neurodiverse. I'm also neurodiverse. Made it a little bit difficult to work on that PhD. Um, students that are returning and that are from historically marginalized communities. Um, we're seeing more and more returning students at NIU. And if you've been out of school for five years or for 25 years, sometimes that gap feels like something you just can't overcome. Um, feels like you don't remember anything. And maybe sometimes it's just like remembering that those things exist, that those skills exist and letting muscle memory take over. But it can feel huge for people that are returning. Um, and we're seeing, especially um, 
a Lori sort of reference to like developmental writing courses, um, we're seeing that even when students would benefit from courses that would prep them for college level work, um, like developmental classes or um, what has been sort of like traditionally um, been referred to as like remedial, um, but these these courses that you get to sort of like think about what skills you need in order to be successful in the classes to come, um, we can suggest them and we can offer them, but we cannot force students to pay for those courses. So this is why we're seeing even more of a gap because historically colleges have been able to say, oh, well, you need these two courses in order uh, to meet this requirement for, for uh, writing in the college. Um, but we wanna put you in this other one first and they had been able to do that. They're not able to do that uh, anymore. We can't um, require people to take extra classes in order to get um, the same result. So um, we are seeing that across the board at universities and students are, um, aren't benefiting from that, um, but they're also not sort of like logged down by all of these developmental classes anymore either. So, um, you know, there's a focus on getting students through in four years. And if they spend a lot of time working on those skills in classes before they get to their gen eds, it's not going to be uh, that swift of a process, right? But students know that they're underprepared and um, they are saying it. Um, when there are studies coming out that students are saying, yeah, it's, it's probably not a great thing that I'm going into college. I need a gap year. I need multiple years. Um, but there's this sense of urgency for a lot of students that if they don't use the scholarships and opportunities that they have now, that they're never going to be able to go to college, that they're never going to be able to go back, that they can't, um, that they're not going to be able to be successful because uh, they'll be lost if they don't do it now. Um, and a lot of these students are feeling underprepared, um, both academically and emotionally. They don't have resources that they need in order to be successful in classes. Um, whether it's technology, uh, housing security, basic things like that. Um, and even if the university can provide some of these things for them, uh, it uh, goes away at the end of the semester. Um, it's short term solutions. Um, and some of them have like just a lack of support. So they don't have connections. They don't have an understanding of a college or how to navigate the systems and the spaces that are um, that are in place. They don't have family outside of um, the university to help support them. They don't feel like they have friends at the university. It's really, really difficult to be successful when you're worried about all of these other things. So we can't change everything for our students. Um, we can't provide them housing security and, uh, you know, three meals a day and best friends. Um, but what we can do is we can show up, um, yes, more and more students are commuting too, and that becomes this other layer of, um, of an issue in some of their, um, circumstances. They don't have as much time to study because they're in their car. They don't have um, you know, they have to work to pay for uh, the gas. They have to do all of these things. So um, they don't necessarily have the time to spend um, focusing on classes. So if they aren't up to um, the skill level that you're expecting them to be when they're coming into your course, uh, it's going to be harder for them to catch up. 
Um, and so something that we can do when we're having students come into our class is we can assess prior knowledge and provide resources. So using early ungraded assignments and having conversations with our students um, can really help to check their level of readiness. Again, this isn't going to necessarily be like, oh, well, you're not ready, so you need to take this developmental course instead, or you need to drop down. Um, but it can give you an idea of what skills they need to work on, what content they need to work on, um, and come up with a plan together. Um, so this is an opportunity for students to show you and to tell you what they know already, what they need help with, what's completely new. So it might look like I've seen people give um, get, uh, hand out exams, basically, that would be like a midterm check. Um, and just to see like what content students already know, what they need to focus on. Um, it might be writing something um, like um, for many of us in the English department, we would have uh, students write a personal narrative or even a letter to you and you get to see what their writing looks like, but then you also um, invite them to tell you about writing. Um, so it, if you're in a history class, it might be um, tell, like write a one page paper about um, wh what do you know about the 1960s or whatever is relevant. So it gives them a chance to show skills to you, but then also talk about the content. Um, and again, that's going to look different for different courses. It could just be um, a quick little quiz that you put together through um, the online you know, exam systems that you use that's ungraded and just is an opportunity for students to show you what's going on and then you know, is easily collected for those of you that teach large sections of students. Um, another thing that we want to make sure that we're doing early on in the semester is establishing what the core concepts of our courses are, what the core skills are, and that we're sharing those with students. So you want to make sure that students really know um, what research writing is. OK, great. So talk to them about what it is, but also share skill or uh, excuse me, she'll share resources that go through that, share templates, share examples, um, give them opportunities to look at what these things look like and to practice that on their own too. Um, many of us use uh, the option of letting students write drafts and get feedback on stuff. Um, but that also might be for those of us that give exams or give quizzes, maybe you give them a chance to practice that and redo things um, and get an understanding of what those uh, what those assessments are going to look like in your course before they get into a, a situation where it has to be graded um, or there's a timed process. Um, same thing with like formatting and citations and um, stuff like that. I hear from people across the university that don't teach English classes that students don't understand citation and they don't understand formatting. And um, I uh, empathize. It's true. Um, but I think that there's also this aspect of are we showing them how to do this stuff? Are we providing them templates? Um, are we providing them YouTube videos that take them through these processes too? Um, we also want to make sure that we're uh, fostering technology literacy, which means that if there is technology required for their class, we want to make sure that they are able to set that up during class, practice using it, um, if they have questions that you can help them uh, troubleshoot or you can help them figure out where they need to go to troubleshoot things. 
So if you're asking them to use the library, take time in class to look at the library uh, web page and to get them to practice uh, requesting a book or figuring out where ebooks are. Um, take time in class to go over to the library. Don't just assume that they're going to figure this stuff out on their own. Um, we have to remember that if you are, um, even if you don't feel like you are behind or underprepared, um, it's sometimes embarrassing to acknowledge that you don't know how to do something. And so a very basic thing of people, you know, walking with you over to um, show how to use the library, um, showing you where to pick up books or that the people that work in the library are friendly and are happy to answer questions. Um, seems very, very simple, but it can have a big impact um, when it comes to the time when students have to do this on their own. <clears throat> I had a student um, last year that I was working with and they were at the end of their degree and they didn't know how to uh, check books out from the library. So they would use books in the library and then if they wanted to use them again, they would hide them. And this is an actual story. And I was like, that's, um, that I, I don't know what to do with that information. And so I ended up showing them how to check books up from the library, which I thought was like a pretty, um, pretty straightforward process, but no one had shown them how to do it. And they were too embarrassed to ask for help. Um, so the fact that they confided in me and said, I'm doing this thing instead was uh, probably a huge uh, moment for them. Um, but I was also very intentional about like, not making them feel silly for not knowing how to do things. Because again, if they're uh, willing to be vulnerable and say, I don't know how to do this thing, um, that's huge. And they're not going to keep asking questions or uh, keep letting you know that they need help if they are getting um, negative feedback or if we're making them feel silly about things. Um, and use a resource library. So if there are basic things that you need for your course, um, that would be like foundational concepts or even things that you are going to explore throughout the semester. Um, keeping a space where you have uh, like a brief description of what it is and then a hyperlink is going to be huge. Uh, videos on this is how you write a thesis statement or this is how you do this citation has been super, super helpful for me um, with my students because they've been told don't look at wikipedia they've been told don't google stuff and um they just don't know when to apply that information and when not to so it can become really really hard for them to assess how to figure things out um, especially if they're not asked to buy a book or if they do uh or if they're supposed to buy a book but they don't actually buy it etc cetera, etc cetera. Yeah, that's a great point, Ellen. Um, if if they don't know what where to get information, they're more likely to um, to do risky things um, in order to get to the answer instead of trying to uh, figure things out. I had a student who once um, made up an entire interview um because they didn't actually know how to go about asking somebody to be interviewed and i think the process like made them feel really uncomfortable and uncertain and so um that made me change my approach to that assignment but then i also made sure that they understood how to um, do that in the future and gave them a chance to uh redo that um but again if you're a first generation student or if you're um 
shy or vulnerable in, in specific ways, feel like you don't belong on campus, can be really, really difficult to ask someone for um, assistance when they don't know you and you feel like they owe you nothing. Um, help students build academic confidence. So uh, we talk a lot about the growth mindset, especially at CIDL, but I think um, we hear that more and more in general. Um, but this idea that mistakes are going to happen and um, mistakes are part of the learning process. Uh, just because you don't know how to do something today doesn't mean you're not going to learn how to do it in general. And it's okay that you don't automatically know how to do something. Um, so if we can give students opportunities to uh, practice things before they're actually graded, or if we can give them a chance to revise and resubmit, this is really great for underprepared students, but it's also great for students that just have things come up. Um, you have a life situation and you turned in something that you didn't get to spend enough time on. You got a grade that you didn't love, but you've been doing over well or overall pretty well in the class. Maybe it's a great opportunity to allow students to revise something and resubmit it. Um, if you are um, working with somebody who's not doing well in the course, um, providing clear and specific feedback on how they can improve their work is really, really helpful. Um, even if it's an exam or something that they should have studied for, uh, giving specific examples of how they might study or where they can go to study can be super helpful. Um, acknowledge the work that they've done um, and that work is hard. It's hard to learn things. It's hard to um, overcome obstacles and they're trying and that's huge um and again we we know that there are mistakes in learning and so talking to students about that and acknowledging that is also huge um acknowledging that you don't expect them to automatically pick up everything um is is a big thing and can make them feel less embarrassed about um needing help or about reaching out when something seems uncertain. Um, some of us teach really, really big classes. So individualized attention can be much more difficult. Uh, but if you allow students the opportunity to set up um, individualized conferences or even small group conferences um, to see where students are, you could even set up um, conference groups of, okay, during this time, we're gonna focus on this specific skill. If you wanna focus on this specific skill, come you know, to this virtual room at this time or come to this physical room at this time. Um, if you uh, can schedule work time, um, during class and then you can uh, walk around the room or uh, create individualized breakout rooms so you can give individual attention to students or again to small groups um, and allow for flexibility and adaptability for uh, students needs and life circumstances um, again students might be underprepared because they're coming in um, with things that have happened to them that have caused them to uh, take time away from their academic career. Um, maybe they didn't do well or weren't able to necessarily pay attention in classes because of a disability, because of an illness, because they're neurodiverse. Um, and so they might come to you with specific needs. And um, if you're able to meet them with flexibility, um, they're more likely to be successful. That doesn't mean you have to do everything that they're asking, but um, being aware of that might be uh, helpful when you're choosing um, to uh, meet students where they are. 
Another thing um, is super helpful is showing examples of work for your class or what study materials and testing might look like. Again, if students understand what your exam is going to look like and they understand like, oh, this is how uh, this program works or this is the type of, you know, short answers, matching, whatever it is, um, that's super helpful. If you can show them what you, if they're going to put together their own study materials, what you suggest they do, that's great. Some people just don't know how to study. Um, I haven't had to study for something in a long, long time. I don't know that I would know how to go about doing it, honestly. I would have to relearn all of that. Um, and it depends on what kind of subject it is too, right? Um, and then if you have a class that actually has projects or writing, um, something that has to be turned in, sharing examples of what that looks like uh, is super helpful. I have had to write so many assignments for my students because I'll change the requirements every year. And so I've written so many research papers, but it's really helpful to show them like, okay, this is what an introduction might look like. This is what the citation page might look like. Um, here's how you apply this information or answer these questions. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. There are so many learning techniques that are out there that we probably use on our own. Um, and if we can talk to our students about them, share them, um, even if it's just sharing, you know, some links and saying, hey, um, spend the first seven minutes of class looking at these and seeing if there's a specific learning technique that appeals to you. Um, that's super helpful. Um, I was talking to Amanda last week, and she um, uses the Pomodoro technique um, and has used it for many, many years um, for her own sort of uh, work schedule and studying and whatnot. Um, but she's also started doing it with her students. So they have specific time that they're going to write and think about uh, the course. And then you get um, to have uh, a break from being productive. Um, so it models it for them, it forces them to do it in class. Um, and then they can take those skills with them outside of the class. Really great for um, people that are neurodiverse also. Um, sorry, Larry, I just saw your comments. I found in conferences, if students write down their revising goals, yeah. <clears throat> Sorry, my voice is going. Um, yes, if they can physically like write something down or make those goals on their own, that can be really, really huge. And yeah, giving um, examples of other students' work is, is helpful too. I tend to um, write my own examples just because again it changes a lot and so I might change the strategy but if you have something that's similar from a previous course or if it just shows like the example of what um, some of the basic parts are uh, it's awesome to be able to share with them student work share with them multiple examples of student work um, retrieval practice is also a great thing to share with your students. Um, so doing something like something like that through um, small quizzes or um, brain dumps and reflections. So something at the end of class to see like, okay, what's stuck with you or at the beginning of class to see um, what they remember from the previous class, what they learned from their readings and give them an understanding of, okay, this is what I wanted you to take away. Um, do you have a grasp on this? No, okay, maybe we need to spend some time on this or you need to spend some time on this a little bit more. Yeah, that's great, Amanda. Um, if you have projects, if you have writing, um, 
asking students if they can if uh, you can share it is always great. And generally, they they will say yes because they love being gassed up and being told that they're doing an awesome job. Um, and I uh, think that showing work at a variety of levels is also helpful. Um, <clears throat> not necessarily like the perfect scores every time, just to give students an idea of like, yeah, this is good work too. Like, you know, we don't we don't have to be perfect with everything. But yeah, students generally are on board if you say you want to share their work. Um, I would um, be cautious with that if you don't have students approving of it. But you could take um, parts of uh, students' work, remove the names, and revise it slightly so you're not necessarily like uh, taking their work and, you know, don't publish it, you know. Um, I think we know that sort of stuff. But, um, but yeah, asking students uh, for their examples is, is super, super helpful. Um, space practice. So, um, sharing with students that they might uh, want to think about using different learning sessions um, so that they can avoid cramming. So uh, we can do this in our classes too. We can bring in the new materials and connect them to the previous materials that they've learned, um, have them write reflections or short papers about that or talk about it in groups. Um, we can space out study guides. So this is something that um, I was a TA for a class that um, gave exams, which is something like very much out of my um, my comfort level. Um, but it was pretty cool because we spaced out study guides so that we would go over, OK, here's these two weeks. This is what we really want you to take away from these two weeks. Think about this for a while. Um, and that was a pretty cool thing so that students had different things that they were working with each week that they were sort of taking into exams with them. Um, it takes a lot of forethought and a lot of um, labor. So I want to recognize that all of this stuff doesn't, you know, it's not going to automatically happen. It takes time, it takes effort. Um, but the more you like, intentionally build these things into your courses, um, the less time it's going to eventually take. Um, giving practice exams or quizzes or practice writing assignments, again, if you can um, give them a chance to uh, practice thinking about the skills and the content in ways that are uh, low stakes because they're not graded or um, maybe they're extra credit, those are always super helpful. Elaborative interrogation. Some of us do this already, um, but having students explain why um, something is the right answer or is true or why they believe something. Um, you know, some of us have classes where there's not like necessarily one truth or um, we're not leaning on um complete facts all the time so having them explain why and contextualize um what they're saying uh with new information and prior knowledge is a really great great way for them to uh click those ideas and be able to retrieve that information and make those connections in the future um so we might do this uh provide EI prompts after readings um, as part of class discussions or in um, small group work. So uh, if we really want to incentivize students doing readings, this might be a good opportunity for us without doing like reading quizzes or something that um, makes it um, gives us a lot of work. Um, and also might uh, get, um, what do I want to say, have, have students sort of sour to the idea of uh, doing readings 
um, if we can get them to make connections and um, talk a little bit about this stuff, talk through these concepts, that might be a better option than just doing some sort of like graded reading quizzes or um, it might be a good way to uh, think about reading journals if we want to do that. Um, a lot of us do this already, but giving concrete examples. Um, so we can either do this in our classes or we can make students do this um, when they uh, report back to us, do small group work, whatever. Um, but making sure that information is being applied to um, real life examples so that ideas aren't so abstract and they can contextualize information. So we do this a lot in, um, in uh, gender and sexuality studies where we might talk about um, specific concepts or um, experiences, um, data, and then we might bring up um, public figures or uh, moments in history to sort of contextualize that information. We do it in um, the writing classroom a lot where we um, we'll talk about skills of persuasion and then we'll talk about, okay, where, where do you persuade people in your personal life? Um, might talk about audience, okay? So how would you talk to your friends versus how would you talk to the members of your church? And so giving them um, that information to sort of contextualize uh, what these abstract, abstract concepts might be um, can really help them uh, work through this information. Um, and then using dual coding, again, a lot of us do this already, but using uh, visuals alongside uh, verbal um, information to help with uh, retrieval. So um, using PowerPoints, graphs, photos, illustrations, um, GIFs, all of those things help students um, remember information and um, you know, this isn't going to be an automatic thing. They're not going to necessarily like remember exactly what you said because you used that specific GIF, but like it's information that they can um, sometimes like they can find it more easily within um, your uh, notes that you've posted for class. Maybe they understand it more from the reading. Case studies. Yes, Ellen, those are also very, very helpful. Um, different things depending on um, depending on your uh, program, uh, you know, like bringing in these sort of concrete examples, it it's going to look different. Um, so so yeah, um, love that. Um, I've also like now it just jogged my brain. Too, um, we don't. I don't think we have anybody from biology or whatever. But um, if we're thinking about concrete examples, if we're talking about the specific thing that happens to the body, um, you know, like if we're actually able to uh, connect it to a specific person, to what that actually looks like on the outside, not just the inside. Um, what are the effects of that? That really helps um, people remember that information. Um, talk to a lot of students from nursing and that's something huge, you know, like you can memorize um, specific information about um, medications, but if you don't know necessarily how that applies to a specific body or um, brain or whatever it is, then that's not super helpful. So can you apply that information to something that makes it more tangible? that uh, brings it into the real world. Um, okay, so I have a few more things that I want to cover, but I want to make sure that I have enough time to um, allow you all to ask questions or um, share your own insights too. So I'm going to cruise through these pretty quickly. Um, but I want to make sure that uh, we're giving students an opportunity to speak up um, 
So if they're asking about content and skills, are they getting an opportunity to do that in a comfortable way? Um, if they're asking questions in class, making sure that everybody takes them seriously and that they're um, received as being a normal part of class, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Um, that it's not abnormal to ask specific questions if they don't know how to use um, the uh, technology provided or if they don't understand what you're saying when you say, like, what's your main argument? What's your thesis statement? Um, you might need to slow down classes to review content and confirm understanding. Uh, not all of us have the luxury of doing that regularly, but maybe that means creating a video um, before the next class that says, okay, here's some things that I really want you to take away or finding a YouTube video of somebody else saying it, because maybe it's the way that somebody else says it that will help it click um, in your students' brains. Um, giving students an opportunity to communicate with you in a variety of ways. I know some of us, um, our brains are, uh, are sad <laughs> because students get in, uh, can contact us in so many different ways and it's so hard to keep track of everything. Um, but letting them know like, okay, these are the ways that I would like you to contact me. You can contact me through Teams messaging. I would love that. Um, but I'm not going to answer that between these specific times. Otherwise, you should email me or creating an anonymous place on um, uh, Blackboard for um, students to post questions so that everybody can see them and everybody can see the answers. That also might be um, a, a great opportunity for that. Um, and if students have questions, letting, uh, creating a space for other students to get those answers too is really, really helpful. So um, I will often create a page on Blackboard that is frequently asked questions so that I will just update it with questions that are being asked. And if I have a chance um, before class starts the next uh, time, if I can say, oh, there's this question about um, this assignment or there was this question about something I said and we can get it out of the way and we can address it um, and normalize asking questions and normalize that uh, not everything I say is super clear all the time and it's okay to, uh, to want to make sure everything is um, that you are understanding the course content. Um, and letting students ask um make requests okay i need extra time because i'm not comfortable writing this thing um and i want to make sure i can go to the writing center is that okay um if there's a specific reason why that's not okay why that doesn't work with your schedule with the plan with the university schedule um just explain that be willing to have those conversations and not to lean on the because I said so, or, um, you know, that just isn't going to happen because um, I don't want it to happen. You know, just be willing to have those conversations, even if you can't uh, meet everybody's needs all the time. Um, and we also want to make sure that we are helping students, as, a, uh, as has been mentioned a couple of times already, um, students that are first generation don't know how to necessarily um, navigate the college system, but also students that are just new to the university in general don't necessarily know how to navigate the space and the community here. So if you know of great spaces for quiet work, share them, have your students recommend places to do that. Um, you can encourage or arrange study groups um, again, you might want to say, okay, well, we're going to have a study group that focuses on this particular skill. They're going to meet in the library at this specific time, and um, I'm going to be on Teams answering questions in the chat. So 
it's an opportunity for you all to get together, work on this stuff and have access to me. Um, you could, you know, actually take spaces, uh, reserve spaces for them in the library. Um, lost my thought. Okay. Um, uh, showing students where the tutoring services are, what tutoring services are available. Um, it's huge if you can walk students to a space or help them sign up. Um, once students get into uh, spaces like the Writers Workshop or the University Writing Center, uh, usually things are great from they're on out um, as long as they're not feeling like they're forced to be there when they're not they don't want to be there um, but students have a hard time finding those spaces they don't know how to sign up for appointments and so if you can help them do that or if you can um, take them to the space and have a tutor or the director help with that um, that's going to be huge um, if they're going to do tutoring services or even studying with uh, study groups, let them know what to expect, how they should be preparing for that and normalize like you that they might not have all the answers themselves. And that's OK to ask questions. It's OK to be unsure. It's OK to be a little bit nervous about um, being in those spaces and um, feeling underprepared because if you feel underprepared all the time, um, I can only imagine that I would just be a little ball of anxiety and um, would just not know how to process information. I felt underprepared in some classes in the past, but not in all of my classes. Um, and some of these students, again, are, are um, coming in after breaks and um, or returning uh, um, and working full time and having all these other things on their plate. So I can only imagine how difficult it can be to uh, find the time to ask for help, but also just know in your classes that you're not necessarily at the skill set that is expected. So I wanted to give you all a couple minutes to. Uh, ask questions, but also share experiences. I know that some of you have um, already done things. I mean, it's clear from the chat that you've done things to support underprepared students. Um, and so if you have anything to share that hasn't been shared, um, even you know something building off of what I said, that would be amazing. Um, if you were an underprepared student, what helped you? Um, and even you have some challenges that you've encountered with supporting um, underprepared students, sharing that would be um, amazing too. We might not have all the answers, but like certainly having these conversations is super, super helpful. Um, so if you want to share, you can either do that in the chat or you can turn on your mic. Either one is fine. Hey, Lindsay, it's Lori. <clears throat> Hi. Hi, sorry about your voice, but you did a great job as usual. Um, oh, well, that's very nice of you. I just wanted to say um, I'm a big fan of templates, both for developmental students and neurodiverse students. I found that they're very, very helpful um, because if you tell students, here's the assignment, um, and maybe even provide them with a sample of student assignment, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to know how to make the jump from seeing the model to actually making it. So, so I think breaking assignments down into manageable chunks is very helpful. And if possible, giving them feedback and a chance to revise on each chunk. And that can be either in class peer stuff. Maybe I'll put a checklist up on the board 
and have them um, switch with a partner and have the partner, you know, check for those things. So it doesn't always have to be me. Um, and like I said, templates really, really, really help. This is a strategy I learned. I have a son with autism and the step by step by step is really hard for him and for a lot, a lot, a lot of students. And so I find that giving them a template where it kind of says, here's the first step and they fill in that chunk. And then here's the second step. Let's fill in that um, is helpful to them. Um, so those would just be the things that I threw out there. I, I will just say one reason I came is I'm doing all the same things I've always done, but I feel like they're working less well. <laughs> um, <laughs> So that's why I was hoping to get some new strategies, which, and you gave a lot of them. Um, my big thing is it's really hard to just enfranchise them if they don't come and they don't turn things in and they don't respond to email. But I, I think, like you said, that goes to not just the lack of academic preparation, but um, emotional or developmental. So I'll shut up now. No, I appreciate you sharing that. And I think you brought up like such a great point too, that the way that we teach and the way that we give information by scaffolding and being very intentional about how we're, um, what resources we're giving students and how we're breaking those things down, showing them this, the little bite-sized pieces and giving them an overview too. That's all so, so helpful. Um, it is 11. Um, and I know some of you have things to do and places to be. So if you have to skedaddle, that's totally fine. I won't be upset. Um, but I appreciate you all being here um, and, and joining in these conversations. I think that they're so important to have.